What is up, Ravens Flop? Huge shout out for your support for the 410 Sports Talk. Chance and Glenn are the best in the business. They're killing it right now. They love talking Raven talk. Make sure you go subscribe to their channel. Let's go, Ravens. Big trust. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of 410 Sports Talk. I'm James Haskell, along with my co-host, Glenn Martin. Friday night edition, Glenn. We are on it Friday night, fresh off of the the job, both of us, but bringing it to you guys as far as uh, the Ravens information. And that is because the Ravens have put out a depth chart, and the first preseason game is tomorrow. So today we're going to kind of articulate what we think about the depth chart, and then also, based on tomorrow, what we think could change. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's get right into it, Glenn. Um, I got a sneeze. <laughs> it went away. <laughs> uh, Look into a light. Um, Apparently um, it helps. I don't know. Now my uh, eyes are watering. Sorry. <laughs> but let's get right into it. I feel like it's going to come back. And let's talk about the the, the depth chart. And then um, and then we'll get into some, some surprises. But where do you want to start? Let's Let's go right there. Well, I guess the first place I'll start is the 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 general, the leader of the of the team, at least what's expected this Saturday. Um, and right now, when I look at uh, the depth chart, no no shocker here. Lamar Jackson is number one on the quarterback depth chart. Wait, what? Uh, it's not Trace McSorley? Doesn't he have a song? I know, I know, shocking, right? Very very shocked. But so we don't, we still don't know how much, if at all, Lamar Jackson will play this Saturday. I think some are anticipating maybe a drive, maybe two, but some are saying. Uh, I don't. I don't want to see Lamar at all. So we we still that remains to be to be seen. But the real intrigue came after him. Is it going to yeah. be McSorley? Is it going to be Huntley? The first depth chart has Trace McSorley listed as the number two and Tyler Huntley as the number three. So uh, um, not not necessarily a surprise after the reports we've been hearing out of camp. Trace has uh, both have looked good, but Trace they said has looked a little bit sharper um, and and a little bit more accurate throughout camp. Uh, so he gets the nod for the first preseason game. But I will say this, Jimbo, I would not be shocked at all to see this change next week. I mean, it really – and I, I don't even know if it's necessarily dependent on performance in this upcoming game. I think that this is a true quarterback uh, competition. And I think that they're each going to get their turn as the primary backup, at least in preseason, uh, to decide who ultimately wins that job to back up Lamar Jackson. I I don't necessarily think that if Trace goes out there and shines and Tyler, uh, you know, puts up a mediocre performance, that this is the 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 final depth chart we'll see all year. I think there's a very good chance that next week we could see Tyler Huntley being the first guy out to either back up Lamar or if Lamar doesn't play, start the game entirely. Um, and I think that also depends on the, the the status of the offensive line and whether they feel they can protect Lamar Jackson. Um, but yeah, I mean, so not surprised to see McSorley, but. Let me ask you, because you're a Tyler Huntley guy, being a Utah graduate, were you disappointed to see Huntley open up as the number three? Uh, initially, yes, but I agree with you in that I think that this thing is still wide open. Mm -hmm. I'm not concerned uh, for his opportunity to be the backup. I think he, based on what I was able to see, everything that Tyler did, he did you know, just the same at the very least, if not better, while we were there. So... I'm not surprised uh, because some of this list and and we were kind of talking about this. Some of this list could be dependent on tenure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if that's the case, uh, obviously Tyler's going to get the nod, or excuse me, Trace is going to get the nod. So yeah, like you said, this could flip flop, and I think this thing's still wide open. The one thing I will say is that I hope Lamar doesn't start because I hope whoever, which one of these guys, whichever one ends up uh, playing in the first half, I want them to get the full simulation of starting the game, mm -hmm. like coming out, you know what I mean? Starting off the game. Cause all those things are important when you're, when you're a QB two, because you know, at any point you're the starter. Yep. Right. It's not like, Oh, well we'll play Lamar quarter and then we'll plan his, you know, his, his exit and then you'll get it. No, like you need to, to get it off. Right. So I hope that they both have a chance to start a game and, and I don't think Lamar really needs to start this game. So that would be my mm -hmm. preference, but no surprise there. I'm still riding with Tyler. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Now, now one thing I go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I don't want to skip over some positions, but we're not going to talk about each one. Cause there's some that have no surprise. And, and the, the one I'm going to talk about now, the running back position, uh, the, the only position that has two names listed as the number one starter. And that's oh, of awesome. course, JK and Gus Edwards, not, not uh, putting one ahead of the other. They're both the starter. So there's two names there. 
and then the Gus told him, he walked in there like Birdman. He said, "Put some respect on my name." <laughs> well, like, look, I think they did that in the off season when they wrote him that check. That's uh, right. They, they certainly showed him the money and showed him that respect. But uh, Justice Hill, also no surprise, is the backup for those guys, and then Tyson Williams uh, and Nate McCrary. Uh, following fighting, up, so fighting yeah. for spots, yeah, exactly, no doubt. Fighting and, and this game, you know, big for like most, you know, not just for their chances is to be a Raven, but for their chances to stick around in the league. And and everyone will be, you know, scouts from all over the league will be watching. Hey, every scouts from game. CFL were there at Ravens at Ravens training camp. Good point. So if their if their career ends in the NFL, they certainly have an opportunity to They'll continue make a couple playing, dollars. Yep, pro sports and pro football elsewhere. So. No surprise there, but where do you want to talk about next? Yeah, let's go right to the big guys up front. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, I think everything everything as of now lined up except one thing. So we both had Ronnie. He's the number one uh, left tackle. Center, Bozeman, right guard. Zeitler, right tackle, v Villanueva. But there are two things I, I want to point out. One, uh, Ben Powers is right now listed as the the starting left guard. So we'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing I want to mention, I know we're going to get to, Tyree Phillips is is mentioned as the number two left tackle in front of Michael Schofield. I think that's important because you 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 and I both talked about Michael Schofield having a chance to make this roster based on uh, versatility. Yeah. Uh, so were you surprised to see Michael Schofield so deep in the depth chart? I think before camp started, I would be surprised to see that. I think uh, because I, I think when they brought in Schofield, they that was kind of an indication that they didn't love what they saw to Andre Smith, who was operating as that left tackle, backup left tackle last season, along with Tyree Phillips. But after seeing when we went to camp, I mean, Tyree Phillips, because Ronnie wasn't out there for, for the team uh, practices. He was doing some individual stuff, uh, but hasn't been out there with, with his unit yet. But we saw a lot of Tyree running with the ones. I mean, it was pretty much primarily Tyree Phillips at left tackle. So once I saw that, this comes really as no surprise. I think they're giving Tyree Phillips all the opportunity to to solidify himself as that swing tackle and and in particular the backup to Ronnie, which is an important gig because Ronnie's still fighting his way back from a tough rehab. Uh, and right now he's on track to start week one, but you look at his history and his career, he's been injured along the way. So that's a very, very important job, a, a job in which in case Stanley is to miss a few weeks, you need to know that you got a guy who can go in there and at least be serviceable uh, and keep Lamar Jackson safe. So I'm not surprised. I will say that the reports out of, out of camp so far with Tyree have kind of been up and down. I've heard some good. I've heard uh, some bad as well. Um, but yeah, I guess that means that Michael Schofield isn't blowing anyone's hair back. He's probably coming in and either is as expected or maybe even a little bit of a disappointment, but it also, like we mentioned earlier, could be just based on the fact that Tyree Phillips has been here much longer and Schofield just got here. So Tyree doesn't have the learning curve as far as having to learn the playbook, learn the calls, learn the, the language. He already knows all that. So that, that also could be playing a part in why we see him getting the primary reps at left tackle and why he's listed as the number two behind Ronnie. Yeah, certainly. And, and so I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, split here i think that part of it is is like we talked about some of this list i think has to do with tenure schofield mm -hmm. is newer to the team but i i do think that you mentioned it but i i'm happy that tyree phillips seems to be holding it down there with ronnie out and and like you said they're giving him every chance so it's encouraging i think as a ravens fan anytime a draft pick is developing as a player mm -hmm. and certainly he has a lot of runway to do so so happy to happy to see that but i want to get to another recent Ravens draft pick. If we can stay around the offensive line, that's Ben Cleveland. You'll notice I said it before. Ben powers is list, listed as the number, number one left guard. Pat McCarry is listed, listed as the number two left guard. Ben Cleveland is the third listed left guard on the Baltimore Ravens depth chart right now. Glenn thoughts. Yeah, I think this is pure smoke screen right now or just I, I don't know if it's smoke screen is the right word but I, I think this is solely based on the fact that Ben Cleveland is a rookie and I'll tell you why when we were at camp when we saw the ones out there we both saw Ben Cleveland operating as the left guard with the ones out there so I, I you know obviously Ben Powers played a bunch of right guard last year and had varying degrees of success certainly was better in the run game than he was against the uh you know in the passing game but and Patrick McCarry, look, he's the ultimate Swiss Army knife. This guy's played literally every position on the offensive line, whether it's in practice or in, uh, in a lot of times in games. So I'm not shocked to see 
Macari there at, at, at the number two spot. Actually, I think if I had to bet, I think Macari's probably the number two at a couple of these spots, but they can't, yeah. they're not going to list them everywhere. Exactly. So no shock there, but I think that Ben Cleveland right now <laughs> is still on track to be the expected starter at left guard. And, and this is more of just a nod to the fact that Ben Powers has been here. He knows the playbook. Like I mentioned, there's no learning curve when it comes to calling, you know, the checks, the, uh, the, the language that they use on the offensive line. He knows all that and he's further along, but most importantly, just the fact that he's been here and Ben Cleveland is a rookie. Cause I think you'll notice it's a reoccurring theme yeah. uh, that, that a lot of these rookies are behind the, the veterans that have been here for a year or two. Yeah, absolutely. So, but it, still interesting that he's not even listed as a number two because and, and no doubt. I, he, do you think they'll operate this way? Like, is this how they're definitely going to operate on Saturday? As far as like, like we'll definitely the see starting ben, lineups and stuff like that. And then right. like, we'll see Ben Cleveland with the twos or the threes in this case. Right. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think they can, because you got to see what this kid's got when the bullets are live. Yep. Because if not, like you got to know soon what you got out of your pick. He has the chance to be your best left guard. Now I'm also at the same time. I think sometimes we don't give, I'll be honest about this. I don't know if we give enough airtime to the potential development of a Ben Powers. Ben Powers in the run game, you know, for all intents and purposes, balled out last year. Yeah. Like the dude became a mauler. And we talked about his incredible win rate in rush in in rushing in running plays. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Now he left a lot on the table, a lot to be desired when it came to the his pass protection. But what if he's turning a corner? You know what I mean? Certainly a possibility. And also, wasn't Ben Cleveland a right guard his entire career at Georgia? Yep. Didn't play a single snap at left guard. So we gotta we gotta also remember that he is transitioning to a, a different position. Yeah. And when they asked Big Alejandro uh Villanueva, he he mentioned that it's it's basically doing opposite motor skills. So I, I'm I'm sure if if uh if Big Al's having a, a, a bit of a difficult time, then a, a player like Ben Cleveland is as well. So you know, it, it, we may have been a little bit quick to just pencil or to, to put him in his pen and at left guard and maybe we should have done it in pencil. But <laughs> right. I, again, I still anticipate Ben ultimately win or Ben Cleveland, I should there say ultimately go. winning the job uh, because like you said, and, and really also I expect him to play the, the, the majority of snaps because <clears throat> you got a pretty good idea of what you got in Ben powers. Now you, there's definitely going to be growth in his game. No doubt about it. Especially and he's going to be at left because last yeah. year he played right. That's true, and, and and there is a finally a, a complete off season program for for Ben Powers, but we also we pretty much know what Patrick McCarry is, right? I mean, yep. we've seen a lot of him in game in in actual gameplay, uh, and big moments. So we we kind of know what he is. So I'm hopeful that we see a ton of guys like Ben Cleveland, because yeah, you're right. We need to see what he's got. We need to know if we yeah. can count on him when the bullets are flying and and it's real real football time. Because this game might not. This game doesn't count on the books, you know. It matters, right. but it doesn't count. Uh, so, yeah, I'm hopeful we see a lot more of Cleveland than we do of Ben Powers, just I because think we I think will. he needs the work. Yeah, I think we will. I mean, John is going to rep these rookies out. Yeah, right? he wants them to see everything and be prepared for everything as as much as they can be. Now, before we move on for the offensive line, I just want to uh, review one more thing. You and I both take took the same nine in our original fifty three. Yeah. Uh, so, in I, I want to ask you if you have a ch- if. I'm giving you a chance. I'm extending an olive branch here, Glenn. Okay. Is there maybe maybe you want to change it up? Because let me give you eight. So, you know, we both took Ronnie, Tyree Phillips, Ben Powers, Ben Cleveland, Pat McCarry, Bradley Bozeman, Kevin Zeitler, Alejandro Villanueva. Mm-hmm. So that leaves a whole litany of a whole a whole group of guys. We got Schofield, Andre Smith, Adrian Ely, um, Greg Manns, Tristan Colon, Castillo. Mm-hmm. and Ben Bredesen. So to me, at this point, it really comes down to Schofield, Bredesen, Colón Castillo. Yeah. yeah. Where are you at there, man? Uh, right now, I'm still in the – Riding with Schofield? I, you know what? I, I guess if I had to – now, you know what? So I had Schofield in. I was looking through my notes. I, I don't yeah, have I'm, I'm pretty sure you had Schofield in based on his positional versatility. Yeah, and I do like that about him. Man, I wish I had my, my list in front of me. Um. Oh yeah, here it is. I do have Schofield. You're right. I did have Schofield making the team, and, and we I both had, did then. And I also had Powers as well. So I had. So if I had to right now, I would probably. I'm leaning towards 
uh, Colon Castillo being that guy and and not Schofield because, you know, I, I haven't seen him run it, getting a lot of play with the ones. And Colon Castillo, if Macari is going to be the ultimate Swiss Army knife, if you, you know, do you want to put him in there at center if there's, or do you want to maybe keep him in your back pocket? That way you can put him at left guard, right guard, right tackle, or even left tackle, which we've seen him in at times play there. Although I think I'd be a little nervous to see him going yeah. out there. Um, but I'm starting to lean a little bit towards uh, Cologne Castillo, but I'm, I'm not sold yet. I, I really yeah. got to wait and see and, and see what happens this Saturday and going forward to see if, if anybody either you know shows they can't do it or, or overwhelms me with, with a, a bunch of good game tape that shows me they really can do it. Um, yeah, I'm I'm with you there. I am leaning heavily towards him as well in, in Tristan Colon Castillo in that um I said it at, at practice. I mean, the only thing that stood out to me, one of the only things that stood out to me about the offensive line, because look, at the end of the day, I'm not gonna act like I'm an expert on off- offensive line play, right? Mm-hmm. I listen to the experts, I try and you know, watch as intently as I can based on my information that I formed from them, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. one of the things that was very noticeable was his accuracy when snapping the football and John, it's also noticeable how important that is to John. I mean, obviously we went out. That's important for every team, but based on what happened last year, they want to keep Macari out of that position. They Looks like, like it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they're done with that experiment. No, I think and, in a pinch, they know he could at least get it. He could do it. But yeah, yeah if, if Colón Castillo goes down and Bozeman goes down. Okay. Right. You know what I mean, but, but I, I think they want one more line of defense before Macari has to be under center. And that's no yep. knock on Macari because he's, he's got a lot of value, like you said, in that he can play anywhere, but I don't think they want him as center. So I think that increases Colón Castillo's chances because Schofield is not a center. Right. No chance. And his dude, I said it on our last show, man, right to the gut every single time. I mean, his, the accuracy of his, his snaps is just, and might sound like a small thing, but look, if you're the best at the, on, on the team at it, Hey, so no, I mean, hang your hat on, right? It may seem like a small thing to the average fan, but when you ask uh, the coaches or the players, I mean, they'll tell you the, it, everything is about timing. So if you yep. throw a high snap or a low snap that causes Lamar to either have to reach a direction or bobble it a, a little bit, that throws off the timing of every other guy on the roster or on the on the field, and it can totally blow up a play. So I yep. think you're right. They chase perfection. They have to be a hundred percent, much like you know kickers in this league, especially when you're talking like extra points and, and inside 30 you need to be perfect if you're not perfect then you're not doing your job and it's a tough that's right. so it's a tough gig uh but i think you're right and i also think that tyree phillips performance could could ultimately determine whether Colon castillo or patrick mccart like because if they don't need that backup swing tackle that you know they don't if they don't need the opportunity to have schofield go in at left tackle because Tyree has shown that he can do it then maybe they can let schofield go and keep Colon castillo yeah uh, so uh, it's a lot that goes into it, but right now, if I had to, to bet, yeah, I'd say they keep uh, Tristan over uh, Schofield. Yeah, I'm with you. Now, I want to move to one more position group that you pointed out in pre, you know, before we started the show on offense, before we move to defense, and that's the tight ends. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to me about that. Yeah, so the tight ends right now, no surprise who's one and two. We have Mark Andrews at one, Nick Boyle at two, who we've yet to see come off pup list as he still recovers from the injury he sustained last year. But the surprise... Well, I'm, I guess we shouldn't be too surprised, Jimbo, because Eric Tomlinson right now is listed as the third tight end, and then uh, they just have a group of four to the to the side, which is Josh Oliver, Eli Wolf, and Tony Poljan. Um, and this could just be another case of, you know, Eric Tomlinson was on the roster last year, played some big time snaps after the injury to Nick Boyle, and this could just be look, he's earned it. He he is a guy we brought back because he's in our plans and. He's been here. He knows the offense, knows the terminology. Um, and these other young guys, they still have to show that they they you know they know the playbook, they know their assignments, they, they can do what's expected of them. And until they show that overwhelmingly, we're going to keep Eric at three. But I think a lot of people right now are anticipating Oliver to make this team because of the athleticism he brings and the vertical threat he provides, which Tomlinson does not. He's more of a, a replacement for Boyle rather than – an extra vertical threat to, to compliment Andrews. So were you at all surprised to see Tomlinson at three? And, and do you expect uh, them to operate that way? Yeah, I don't expect them to operate that way. Uh, I think that, so I was a little surprised because when I went to camp, there's a significant drop off Mark Andrews, Josh Oliver. And then to me, it was 
the crowd, right? Like not saying that he's Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews is just ridiculous out there. He looks incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, but the only one that to me can, can even come within the same stratosphere of, of, of a Mark Andrews would be, would be a Josh Oliver in passing in, in passing situations where he's running routes. Certainly on uh, that Tomlinson obviously is a proven blocker, but man, these other guys can't, I mean, you can see it in the stiffness of their hips in and out of their breaks. They're not route runners like the other two, like Andrews and, and, and Oliver. They're just not. And uh, as long as Oliver stays healthy, I, th I think he makes it. I, th I think he makes his team. I tell you what, Glenn, every, at least two times a week, three times a week, maybe someone is adding us on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And they're reminding us about the way Oliver's looking while they're at practice. Yeah. Oh, he stands out. There's yeah, no so doubt about it. And and you know, Tomlinson, we like him, but he's more of he's more of an insurance policy for Nick Boyle mm -hmm. um, because he's got that huge frame. Now Oliver's a big guy too. I think Tomlinson. Let's see, he's listed at six six two sixty three, and Tal and Oliver, I'm sorry, is six five two fifty nine. So both big guys. Um, and, but, you know, Tomlinson just plays more physical, uh, you know, in the, at that point of attack. So he's just yep. better as a, a blocker. He's a more and, dedicated blocker. I feel like, right. Like it's part yeah, of I his mean, DNA and, and, and his, his blueprint, you know, that's what makes him his spot on the roster that he yep. can, he can use his physicality, uh, and move guys that are bigger than him, uh, and certainly open up lanes. But, you know, the other guy, Eli Wolf, he's just too small in my opinion. You know, he's just, he would have to be so dynamic in the passing game in order to, to carve out a, a, a spot on the roster because I just don't know how much he can bring, um, you know, because he's listed uh, or on here at 6'4", 238. Yeah. You know, that, that that that's just – that's a little small in the Ravens' tight end room. I mean, normally they're at 260 or north of that. Um, and so I don't, I don't think he's got the size. Now, Tony Poljan does certainly, – certainly does the rookie, 6'7", six, six 251 pounds. Uh, and he certainly has the frame to add more weight to that. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I think real it's a long stiff, shot. no real explosion either in, in Polish. And I think he could call, he could carve out a nice backup spot, kind of like how Tar Tomlinson has done uh, in his career. But I agree with you. I think unless Nick Boyle is, is just not ready and they have to start the season with him on the pup list and he's going to be forced to miss the first, was it six weeks of the season? I, I just don't know how. It, Oliver doesn't make this team because he's by far the best vertical threat outside of Mark Andrews that we got. Yeah. And his basketball background has shown that he can play the ball. He can he can go attack it at its highest point and make plays. Uh, and we know Lamar Jackson loves attacking the middle of the field, like a lot of players and a lot of teams. If you if you own the middle of the field, usually you own you know you own the game. So it, it's yeah. very important. And Josh Oliver would certainly do a long way of helping the Ravens uh, to do that. Yeah, so that's going to be really interesting. Definitely something to keep an eye on tomorrow. We mentioned that before, but that's one that I could anticipate changing, uh, certainly as far as the depth chart alignment goes. So let's move over to the defensive side of the ball. What you got? Yeah, so I mean, the, the the big one for me when I was looking through here, I mean, there's a few of them that kind of jumped out at me, um, but they're not willing to give the number one rushing, you know, the rush position is how they have it listed uh, at linebacker here. They're not ready to just pencil in. Justin Houston, they got Pernell McPhee listed above or him. Or Udafe Owe, neither of them. That's true. Udafe Owe and, and Justin Houston, both second on the depth chart behind, uh, let's see, Justin's behind Pernell, and Udafe is behind Tyus, Tyus Bowser. Yeah. Um, so no no real surprise as far as putting Tyus above Udafe because of the fact that they just inked him to that long-term deal. He's been here for years and and really solid him, solidified him his role and made sure – uh, everyone, you know, the, the guy's a player, you know, so I, I get that. Um, now when there's a passing situation, uh, uh, where you need a rusher, I don't think there's any chance Bowser's in there over away. I don't care how this is listed. Um, but I could see a scenario where Tyus Bowser plays just as many snaps as Adafi Owe. So that's not really that big of a shock, but Pernell McPhee being listed above Justin Houston. Look, I mean, that, that, that's very um, – now, it could be this. It could be like, look, Purnell's list is a starter because on first down we want Purnell out there because it's it's a more of a typical running down. And we you know, – Purnell McPhee is still fantastic against the run. Love he's his a mammoth. Physicality. Yeah, he's just – I mean, as big as Justin Houston is, when he was walking next to Purnell McPhee, Purnell McPhee is just bigger. I mean, he's just a big, scary-looking, intimidating guy. He's a redwood. It's like they're two different types. I mean, if you think about – you know, you think, oh, man, that's a large maple tree. And then you look at a redwood, you're like, that's not such a big tree anymore. No. You know what I mean? Like, they're just, they're Pernell different, McPhee is man. just McPhee a big, is... big dude, man. He yeah. is big. He's got heavy hands. So, 
I can I can see it from that perspective that that they might expect Purnell to be in there more uh, in those early downs yeah. when they when they anticipate run. Uh, but just like I said with Adafe, if it's a passing down, Justin Houston's going to be in there because he's just by far the better pass rusher. Uh, but still, nonetheless, a little surprising. Maybe it's just like we said earlier, the veteran, the fact that Purnell's been here and Justin's very new to the team is why he's there. And the same could be said for the other side with with Tyus and Adafe. Yeah, it's de- yeah, it's definitely gonna be interesting. So when I saw that, it started making me think. All right, maybe this is ninety percent tenure, ten percent, you know, performance. But I don't know because I feel like every position group is kind of, it kind of changes, right? Because uh, you know, we talked about it. I think Trace being in front of Tyler, I think that's a statement. I don't think it's it's something they just did. Oh, Tyler, he's been here longer. So anyway, it's just really hard to tell, but. Uh, the other one that you brought up as well, inside linebacker, of course, you got uh, Patrick Queen. But Malik Harrison is in front of LJ Ford. And look, this is a perfect example. LJ Ford's been here longer. This is his third year here, right? I think so. I think he's he going in... into his third year here, if I'm not mistaken, because yeah. he came in halfway through. He came in around the time that um, Marcus Peters came in, right? Yeah, I believe you're right. Yeah, that's a good point. And so he's behind Malik Harrison. So Malik is is listed as the starter next to Patrick Queen. Yeah. And so the tenure thing is kind of broken here. So it's definitely interesting. We haven't. I mean, but Malik's, it's not like he's a rookie. Malik's not. No, a rookie. he's not a rookie. That's yeah. true. And it might be like you're saying he's definitely a first, second down guy. Yeah. Yeah, and LJ Ford is more known right now to helping out in the passing game. Certain certainly he was covering the flats like an absolute monster in that Tennessee game, and yeah. and was uh, erasing Derrick Henry as soon as he touched the ball. Yeah. Um, but Malik Harrison, I'm happy for the guy because I know there's a ton of people that have been in our comments that expect, I mean, some expect Malik Harrison to ultimately take over for Patrick Queen. Um, so there's a lot of fans out there that really like what they see out of Malik Harrison. Um, so I'm hopeful that he does get the opportunity because this is another situation where we don't really know exactly what we got in Malik Harrison, where LJ Fort, he's been around the league. This is what his third team. I know he's with the Steelers. He was with the Eagles. Yeah. I think this is his third team. Sign him to that extension. So obviously they like him and they want to keep him around. But we know what we got in LJ Ford. I don't think they really know what they have in Malik Harrison just yet because he had such limited play time last year and no offseason or preseason. Uh, so maybe they're just seeing more and he's he's really impressive and, and and he deserves that spot. Or this could be a situation where they expect Malik in on first and second, those running downs, and then they're going to bring LJ Ford in on the more passing, more common passing downs, and that's why they're listed. Uh, in the order in which they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be it's so hard. It's difficult to decipher this list, certainly. Um, and, and something that, you know, we're actively trying to do the other position I want to get to here on the defensive side of the ball. Like you said, on the outside, Glenn, we're not going to go over every single one because I feel like to me, the corners pretty, pretty much what we expected as far as Marcus and Marlon, and then following that up, Jimmy and Tavon, and then the rest of it, they're still walk, working through. But there was one in the corners that you mentioned um, that I don't know if it matters or not, but Chris Westry, you know, in the list all the way to the right, where it's just a list of guys, is listed ahead of Sean Wade. Does that mean anything to you? That's a little surprise. I mean, look, it could just be uh, that, I mean, mistake, correct me if I'm wrong, is it not just um, alphabetical when they're in that clump together? N- no. So I was thinking about that, but obviously, you know, if you do the last name, that doesn't make sense. And then if you do the first name, there's other groups where it's not that way in the first name either. Like for example, uh, Devin Gray is, is lifted, listed above Benjamin Victor, you know, as we know, unless we're Kevin Malone here, B comes before D, right? So, um, remember when he tries to do the alphabet, Kevin Malone? No, I don't. Oh my gosh. He's like, L I man, no. I mean, he like, can't remember what it is. That's so sad. Okay. All right. I get it. All right. Well, if that's the case, then yeah, this is surprising because Sean Way was a draft pick and Chris Westry was not. Now, it doesn't surprise me when I was out at camp and not only what I saw with my own two eyes the day I was there, but also, I mean, like we mentioned earlier, we talked to pretty much every media member, both local and national, uh, that was in attendance and that had been in attendance for all the practices. And Chris Westry has just been popping. I mean, this yeah. guy is six four, a uh, corner who who really uses that length and that size to his advantage, um, and has been very very impressive. I mean, he's just a pa- the, the way it has been described is a pass breakup waiting to happen, and yeah. you don't see a ton of six four corners, so that alone makes him unique. And then 
if he can start stacking consistent practices behind it, uh, he can certainly make a name for himself and possibly make this team. Now, the opposite has been said about Sean Wade. I mean, the guy has struggled. And when we were there, he was getting routinely beat by the by the receivers on this team that aren't even expected to make the final roster. Jalen Moore was taking him to school. We saw Gray give him the business. Sean Wade has been – if I had to name one biggest disappointment of this draft class, it would certainly be Sean Wade as of yet. I mean, he, this could be a guy who is the prime candidate for the IR stash. Uh, but nonetheless, it's it, a little bit surprising just because of their draft status. And uh, yeah. typically they give, you know, the, the draft pick the nod. But yeah, not in this case, Jimbo. No. And then the very last one I want to get to is the the safety position. Of course, you got Chuck and Deshaun and then you got Levine uh, as well. But something that's interesting, you know, right behind Deshaun Elliott is not Brandon Stevens, not our Darius Washington, not Geno Stone, Jordan Richards. And I know we said before this might be based on tenure but he did make some plays out there that that were worth mentioning uh and then the other thing too is that stevens is ahead of washington so are you starting to is your confidence in washington be able to make the team starting to wane because it is for me i feel like it might be westry over washington as far as that last db spot goes i i, I tend to agree with you and we both had washington on our roster when we initially did our 53 but I agree. I think I think Westry has made so many plays, and and Ardarius, I'm sure has has looked okay, but not good enough to where I didn't hear anyone talking about him. Now, not in a negative way either. Just kind of meh. Like he's just he's been there, but he hasn't he hasn't done anything that just makes you think, wow, he's got to make this team. Um, and and that's a little bit I don't know, disappointing. He was the fan favorite, uh, yeah. uh, being the next undrafted guy in the long list of undrafted free agents that makes this, uh, you know, roster. But yeah, I mean, I don't think unless something changes now, look, he could go out there and ball out and get his hand on a couple balls, uh, in the preseason and things could obviously change. But right now, if I had to give the edge, I would certainly give it to Westry. And also when you consider the, the Ravens philosophy, there's not many positions they value more than cornerback in the, on this team. I mean, they, they understand the value in this team. They they even out they, they value coverage over even pass rush, and they've shown yeah. that by how they draft and how they sign players. Um, that they, they just feel that coverage right. is all the, the dollars. Important. Yeah, exactly. Look, really easy to see. I don't think you'll find a more expensive secondary, maybe in all of football, uh, yeah. than than the Ravens. So they certainly value, um, and most of that money is tied up in their corners. Of course, they 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 pay Chuck, but not in Earl. Yeah, but when you look at that Marlin deal, you're talking a hundred million dollar guy, and then Peters is is very highly paid as well as well. And Tavon Young, when he signed his deal, he was the highest paid slot. Corner and Jimmy, in the and he's on year to year deals, but I think not he's cheap. Eight, he's eight million this year, or eleven, eight or nine, think, or something like that. Yeah. yeah, he's right up there. So they spend their most money on on the cornerback position. So I think that 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 also tells you that they they value that a lot. Um, and, but a little surprised about Jordan Richard. Look, he's been, he's 28 years old. He's been in the league seven years. So I'm sure that that experience helps him. And he, and he might very well be a, a fantastic special teams, uh, player, but only recorded three tackles in all of 2020 last year. So mm -hmm. it's not like he went out there and was balling and is just making his name. Uh, this could just be a tenure thing. And, and, uh, ultimately we could see, um, you know, Geno Stone supplant him. We could see, uh, even our Darius Washington, but right now, uh, and I, and honestly, if I had to predict, I think Stevens will supplant Richards in that spot because Stevens was one of the players that was super impressive in camp. I mean, a guy who's new to defense did yeah. not look like he was new to defense when we saw him out there at training. Now, the only thing I'll add to that is that even if Stevens jumps Richards as the backup to Deshaun, that means you still got Levine. I feel like people are putting too much confidence in the fact that the not confidence in Levine. A confidence in the fact that the coaches are comfortable with him being a safety if one of these guys go down, like a true safety. I don't think that's a situation they want to be in, and I think that bodes well for our, our Darius to still have a chance to make this roster because I really don't think that they want to see that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, there's no chance that Levine's not making this team. It's just, right. yeah, right. Do they want to put him in a center field type role if there were an injury to one of the guys on the back end i don't think they do he's right now he's listed as a db slash linebacker because the most of the times right. we see him he's playing the dime linebacker role he's playing some nickel corner he, he's not a guy that we we really ever see going back and covering the deep third so i agree with you there i think that is an opportunity i think that's why our darius ultimately signed with the ravens and undrafted yeah. when 
he was the most highly coveted undrafted guy out there. And I'm sure he had a ton of opportunities. Well, he's, I, I, I still have some faith that he'll go out there. Who knows? Maybe we'll have two guys that make the team undrafted this year, but uh, it's going to be really interesting. I still have some faith. He's going to go out there. Like I said, I think last night he might get his, I think he's going to get his hands on the ball this, this Saturday. Uh, but let us know your thoughts, guys. Any surprises in the list? What's your take on the list in general? What's your take on our take on the list? Mm-hmm. And what are you expecting to change after this game? Uh, let us know what your thoughts are in the comments below, and we'll talk to you guys.